guys, first off, I want to thank everybody that's following us um, here live, and then anyone who's listening to it as a, an actual podcast later. Um, really, really lucky to have Jay join us here tonight. Jay, I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Absolutely. We are, Jay is a friend of mine. I've known, I think I met you in 2003. Right, I was thinking it was at, a, was it at Oshkosh, Jerry? No, I think the first time I met you was down at Wild Rose. Was it Wild Rose? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I remember you playing Drake, little Drake. Yep, yep. Oshkosh. Yep, yep. And, uh, and you had, was it Duke? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Stars, man. Yeah, so that was, I think it was 2003 because I just, it was my first major purchase after graduating college. That was uh, the summer after I got out of school and I couldn't wait to spend some money on that dog. <laughs> So, but yeah, so it, it's been a while um, since since we met, and we both met um, at a, actually a workshop, a Wild Rose training workshop. Yep. And that was the first that that was the first time I had ever been to something like that. Um, was that the first yeah. one you were at? It probably was. Um, yeah, because I bought Duke in August of two thousand and three, I believe. And uh, yeah, and then I basically. At every possible event that I could be at Wild Rose for the next ten years, I was there. Right, right. So that it kind of it dates us a little bit. I mean, we were yeah. we're only we're twenty five and twenty six now, right. so it's oh, you know. We, we started when we were 10. Yeah, we, so, we got rides down there, but um, but so yeah, so it kind of dates us a little bit. But what what I think is really interesting is, you know, it, they the guys down at Wild Rose, guys and girls down at Wild Rose, were real influential on me, um, especially early on. Um, sure. and, and that was, and, and from, so I've, I've gained a lot there, but I've also gained some really good friendships from it. Uh, you're a perfect example. Craig Corp is a perfect example. Um, numerous, numerous Blake. I, there's just a bunch of guys and in, in, in girls too, that over the years now we've, I've really developed really good relationships with. So that's been a nice bonus of it. Right. Um, and like you said, I mean, that, that is, that dog that we're talking about was my very first dog I ever trained. Um, so I really, uh, I cut my teeth. I learned 85, 90% of what I do every sure. day with my talkers down sure. there. With sure. guys. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that was your first dog. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, a I was a rookie, big time rookie. Cool. Well, that's cool. I mean, it's, imp- it's impressive. I mean, it's kind of impressive when I think about it that way. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so Raglan. Yeah. Why well, now we fast forward and Raglan Gun Dogs. I listened to you on a podcast. Um, it was last summer and I don't remember what podcast it was. I texted you after it because I was on the road and I was like, God, it was a really interesting story. I'd like to see if you could share with us just a little bit of how you find yourself now with Raglan because I want to introduce a backstory of it before we start talking about kind of the, the, the real reason I pinned you down here. Right. Um. So like Jeremy said, in 2003, I started with Wild Rose Kennels in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, bought a dog, trained it, went real well, um, developed a very close friendship with Mike Stewart and his wife, and uh, actually became what's called an associate trainer. So I would, I would, I live in Illinois, I'd go to Mississippi, get dogs, bring them back to Illinois, train them for clients, and then take them back down there and deliver them. Um, I did that for about 10 years uh, with Mike, and again, uh, just friends of a lifetime throughout all that that I gained. And in February of 2013, Mike and I actually went to England and uh, we were visiting some different Labrador kennels. And a friend of ours that we were with set up for us to rabbit hunt over Cocker Spaniels, uh, which that's just multiple things in that sentence sounded really wrong to right, me. Right. One, Cocker Spaniels was the worst thing about it. Um, and rabbit hunting with one seemed awful as well. But it, it was a day that completely changed my life. Um, when I got there that day, I was thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That was probably at 8 o'clock in the morning. By 12 o'clock that day, I said, I've got to have one. And June of 2013, I imported my first cocker. And life is, I, I turned my back on Labradors for the most part. Um, I still have a couple that I will goose hunt with. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 
Cockers, you know, changed my life. And in the little bit of a backstory, the day that the gentleman that we hunted with that day, his name is Ian Oakershaw. Um, again, I didn't know who that was. That didn't mean anything to me. Uh, now, if you're a spaniel person at all, Ian Oakershaw is kind of the god of spaniels, especially in the UK. And uh, and he got me started. Uh, really was extremely influential in getting me started. In fact, uh, our kennel name is Reitland, and Reitland is actually a word that that I made up. Uh, Ian's kennel was called Ritex, so I took the rye of that, and then my best friend of the world, his name's uh, Nigel Carvel in Northern Ireland, owns a kennel called Astroglen, and those two gentlemen are who really got me started, so I just combined their kennel names, and here we go. I made a couple words. It's uh, awesome. But then, so that was in 2013. Fast forward to April of 2020. Uh, we have... In the kennel right now, we've got 11 mama dogs, three stud dogs. I've got five dogs in for training right now, and we go full time. I'm right. actually a full dentist too. Yeah, I was gonna say because you uh, you have own a dent. You're you're a dentist and you have a dentistry right. outfit, I, right? I was a dentist before COVID nineteen. Sure. And now an employed dentist that trains dogs, so it's great. I love it. We're all unemployed, it seems these days, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so so cockers cockers are. Uh, yeah, I mean, cockers are my thing now. That, that's what I do. Um, Mike Stewart and I still do some seminars around the country together, uh, which is cool for us to partner back up and do some stuff together. But uh, but no, cockers are are my full time gig. And Ian Ian Openshaw is kind of is pretty legend. Like, I mean, today I don't know how I don't know the, I don't know a lot of history on on the cockers. Um, I know anywhere today, uh, I've talked with numerous people, I've hunted with, I've shared camp with a bunch of people over the few, last few years that had Cocker Spaniels, and if you bring that name up, that's the one that everybody, it's, right. he's... Right. Yeah, I mean, he, he is, uh, he's legendary, I mean, and I, I say that, uh, yeah, I mean, he's legendary, but, you know, when, as you know, Jeremy, I mean, when you're on the top of your game, you're also very hated because you're the best. Sure. Um, so he's a he's admired but hated all at the same time. Uh, but but there's no one uh, like I went over in January. I we bought a dog that ran the Cocker Championship in England this year. Um, so I got to go over and watch him run my dog. And uh, he handled it right. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, so I, I just, saw that. Uh, strictly was, uh, but he. Uh, I mean, he's the best, and, and no one. Love him or hate him, you can't really argue that fact. I mean, he's got a hundred and he's made a hundred and probably thirty champions, which is a record that will never be beat by anybody. Sure. Ever. He's an eight, he's an eight panel judge over there, isn't he? Yes, sir. Yeah. I, an eight panel, I believe an eight panel both in the Labradors and the Spaniels. I think so. I I get um, Gun Dog Journal. It's uh, yeah. And and yeah. he was just in it as a judge, I think, for the Irish field trial yeah. champion. So, which is, which again, it kind of goes to the idea of, guy's legit, like he, he is, and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not into, and I don't dig real deep into the field trials, um, right. but the, I, I'm, I'm very interested in him, I just don't know a ton about him, but the, the what I do know about him, and within being a part of both, like, he, it just doesn't, doesn't happen by dumb luck, like it's, it's pretty earned, right. Um, so process, right? Uh, he, uh, yeah, he, he's he. Like I said, he he is he's very good at what he does. But at the same time, um, he's the, the amazing and great thing about him is he never stops learning. He never stops. What do I have to do next? To be sure. Um, he's not in love with his methodology necessarily. I mean, if there's a, if there's something he can do better, he'll do it better. Um, and, and that's even, I mean, I, I know this is one thing, one of the main things we're going to talk about, even play sports. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, when I first met him, he had just been to the United States and went to California. I met a guy by the name of, I believe, Gary Breitbart. And I don't know that man at all. But, but that gentleman is who first introduced him to play sports. Um, and now that is... The foundation of his a lot I would say is the foundation of his training. Sure. Um, but I mean, even at that point, seven years ago, he was the best. 
but he's traveling to the United States to talk to a man and spend time with a guy that can help him eat better. Right. Um, I love it. Know, that's, the, that's the definition of, of a confident, successful person. Right. We talked about it. Um, I don't know if we. I don't know if we talked about it in our last podcast. I know we've talked about it in a couple of them, but we've talked about the value of what, what my par- my business partner told me is be the value of being this lifelong learner. And I think it's you, it's a perfect segue because the whole idea, and, and it's not the only reason, but a major reason that I wanted to ask you to be a part of this was to talk about place board training. Um, Craig, our mutual friend, Craig gave me, I've got it right here, he, he gave me this video, and, and you know Craig, you know Craig very well, um, he's a great guy, like he's probably one of, he's a great trainer, um, he's an even better person, and I just think, I, I think the world of him um, on a lot of different levels, but I was at his place before this whole COVID thing started, um, I was at his place, we, we went there, I went there, we were going to train together, we ended up talking for about six hours, and we trained for about an hour. But in that conversation, he opened up a library to me uh, of his, and I'm sure he's done it for other people. But he went through and he handpicked a f- couple things, um, books and videos. Um, this was one of the videos, and a Baklu Springer Spaniel video um, was yeah. was a was yeah. one that he gave me. For sure. And, and, and so, and I had not seen those. Um, I had never watched a Spaniel video before and probably naively uh, didn't watch a Spaniel video because I don't train Spaniels and I thought I don't need a Spaniel video. So when he gave it to me, I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, I'll bring it home and, and if I get time, I'll watch it. And I decided to watch this one. I'm, I'm watching the, the Springer one right now, but I watched this one. And the reason I did was because I'm training a dog right now, um, really nice dog. One of my, one of the, they all are kind of your favorites, I guess, but this one's become a favorite. And I've got a little bit of a, a, it's not an issue, but it could be an issue pretty soon, I think. And it's something that I'm thinking about different ways of how, to, how can I fix or correct it. So the dog's name is Bella and the, the issue I'm having with her, and I've only, and I see it something, and I've realized recently that sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. But it's this delivery. Her hold is fantastic. Um, she's never going to spit a bumper. She oh, she's very willing to share. Um, it's never never been an issue with that. It's her positioning. And so as she comes back, she I love her her speed. She's very um, she's she's a real stylish little dog. She comes back to me with a lot of momentum and enthusiasm. Too much at times. And so I've used a, a, a wall behind me, a fence behind me to slow her. I've done different things. And I've gotten good results, and then it gets sloppy, good results sloppy. And I started thinking about this video when he gave it to me, and I watched it, and I thought, I don't know why I wouldn't do that. But I wanted to talk to you about it because, A, I wanted to find out where you – because I know Craig uses them. Like, I pulled up to Craig's driveway. He had them in his driveway. I talked with Craig about it just a short bit, and he brought up – the use of them early on, he, I think he uses them a lot. And I told him, I said, I've never used one. I, I use play, I use a, a bed for place, but I don't use it functionally for training. And so I wanted to talk with you about it, and I wanted other people to um, listen to it, I guess, because it goes back to what you were just saying. I think there's something that I could do better, possibly, that will help me with some specific things. I want to learn as much about it. So I watched this video, this video was like the gateway. And now I go, okay, now I'm gonna pick a bunch of other people's minds and figure out when and how I think I can use them. So I, I've got like, and I don't take notes, rarely, but you hang around Craig long enough and you'll have a notepad. Take notes if you're on Craig. Yeah, so I've got this little notepad with some notes, but before I, it was questions, things that I wanted to make sure that I had in the top of my head, but A, I wanna talk before we get into those, if you'd be willing to share with me your thoughts on it, because I, I really, in that video, Ian talks about meeting this guy in California, yeah. spending t- spent a day with him, I think he said, and he, he said it multiple times, I think, and I haven't watched it twice, so I've only watched it once, but right now I want to say it was five or six times at least, I heard him say, this is, I've never been able to do this with a cocker before. I've never had this kind of result this quick with a cocker. Um, 
and so he's he's a he's a big. I mean, he he is he, he's pro the use of these things. He's a he is one hundred percent sold on the idea, and I love that he says very early on. I learned it from the guy whenever it was so many years ago. Right. I think it speaks right. volumes about his willingness to a be honest and yeah. and b be that lifelong learner. Right. And and the thing, I, and I believe he says it in that video too, Jeremy. He talks about it's taken. I believe he. I believe the quote is it's taken months off of my training. Yeah. Uh, just because I mean, all dogs, especially cockers, if they're not focused, it's a train wreck. They've got to be focused on you. They've got to submit to you. They've got to give you their eyes. Um, and the beauty of a play sport is it takes, it, it gives the super submissive dog a secure place to be, to where it's safe. It's not, it's not, you're not intimidating to them, but it takes that overly confident dog and it gives them a place to be. So it, you can take both ends of the spectrum and the board can, can make it a beautiful thing. Sure. Uh, I'm not a big fan of super early on, you know, 8, 10, 12 weeks putting a dog on a board necessarily. Mm -hmm. I want that dog to have some confidence and drive and, and love to retrieve for me, love to bring the ball back to me. Um, but what you were just saying with Bella, I mean, you can clean up a delivery. Right. I mean, they're still used to running back to that board and you're standing at the end of it. And they just, they come up, they sit down and they just raise their head to you. Right. And it just becomes habitual. Um, and you sit there, you love on them, you let them have the bumper, you know, you take the bumper away, you let them have the bumper back, you love on them some more, and, and everybody wins. I mean, sure. it's just, and, and uh, you, you had that, that DVD, he actually has, I'll put this up close, a new one okay. um, that just came out, and the cool thing about this is he talks about everything I've learned in the last five years with play sports and how we're using them, things we're doing with them. Um, and he shows a lot of problem dogs that he fixes or mm -hmm. his, his trainer fixes um, with the boards. Sure. And he narrates the whole thing, tells you why things went wrong, how he's fixing it. Um, it. It's just unbelievable some of the basic things that you can get down on these boards before you go to the field and really start doing them big. That, just going to make it so much easier to do it. So is it, do you think it, so here's what my thought is, and, and correct, you tell me if I'm not thinking right, but the idea, of the, the idea of the board, first off, I think one of the most important things that I took away from the video was size. Like he's using a pretty, I think it's 15 by 30 15, or something? Right, 15 by 24 by uh, three and a half. So it's a two by four on edge is yep. what he uses. Um, but, but I, and I, I've used those for years, um, and they're great. But I always, a little plug here, I always thought, why doesn't somebody make one of these commercially that's easy to use? Mm -hmm. They have. So this is what's called a Kato board. It's plastic. Um, it has AstroTurf on it. Uh, a guy by the name of Jordan Horak, who actually lives in Wisconsin. You texted me that, uh, yeah. Yeah, she just started making these. Um, they stack on top of each other, and that, they're that approximate size. Sure. What is the uh, dimension? Do you know the dimension on that one? I, I don't know the exact dimensions, but it's extremely close to that that you sure. said, 15 by 24. Yep. Um, and, and with either this one or, or the homemade ones that you make, um, Labradors, Cockers, Ian says in the new DVD, he actually he has an Irish Wolfhound, which is yep. enormous. He'll put an Irish Wolfhound on. Sure. It, uh, so any size will work, but you don't, I mean, smaller the better. 15 by 24 is the perfect size for everybody. Yeah, I, the takeaway for me was, my, here's my concern. So I, I won't even beat around the bush. I'm just going to tell you my concern with it. So I love place training the dogs. We, we just, it's a big thing that we build in, um, probably more so for not in the field, but you know, in the house and in when we travel and different, different scenarios. I just think it's such a valuable, valuable tool for us to incorporate the dogs into everything that we're doing. And one of the things that I'm really cautious of, and I've been cautious of, and it's bit me in the butt plenty of times is the idea of allowing dogs to come on and off. I, 
I have so much more success when I am black and white with the idea of they don't come off of there until I'm going to go over there and get them. Um, eliminating the idea of a dog sneaking off the bed. And, and I've had, you know, it's worked very, very well for me to be real clear, not no, no gray area type thing. The thing I'm thinking about, and I started thinking about this since I watched the video, is differentiating the size of place. Like my, my beds are not 15 by 24, they're bigger than that, cons considerably bigger than that. Where I call it, you know, a place where they're gonna go and they are not allowed to stay, or not allowed to leave, that's their spot. This is significantly smaller, and after thinking about it, so my hesitation was always, am I gonna get this dog, if I start switching boards and, and, and sending dogs back and forth, calling to, you know, as this, as and so people that don't, haven't watched the video, um, it's this process, and I'm gonna let Jay explain a little bit more, but it's this process where you got multiple boards and you really can direct the dog back and forth from place to place, regain focus, look to us, kind of look to us for direction. And it's quite a way to connect. I just see a, I see an incredible connection with the dog to be able to do that and, and avoid or, or be willing to not be distracted by potential things around them. Really in, impressive from that perspective. My fear was always, yeah, but if I get him doing that, when I put him on place, is he going to creep? Is he going to come off? Is he going to do his own thing? And I think if I differentiate these places in the scenarios I'm using them in, I think I can get away with it. Is that sound, does that sound right or not? Uh, I've, I've honestly never thought about that. And but no, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, I, uh, I, I don't think you'll have a problem with that at all. I, I, I mean, any time a dog moves off a board, I'm commanding them. To sure. Move the board. Um, so, and the great thing about <clears throat> the board is the purpose of it being, you know, three inches tall or three and a half inches tall, whatever it is, um, it's very, very, very spatially defined. Yeah. So, when they put their foot off, okay, you know and I know you're off your place. So, I'm going to pick you back up and I'm going to put you back on again. It doesn't take many times of that correction at all for them to realize, okay, I broke the rules. It's not as if I'm starting with uh, a yoga mat or something. Right. But you, know, you use, and, and I just saw on your Instagram page, you're using what's called a Quran bed. Yep. Uh, I'll take those Quran beds in my house. The dogs get on those. Those are their place. But I'm really quickly, I go through a towel at the top of it. And then I'm quickly getting rid of that bed, and that towel becomes place. And and you can get a dog where you go to somebody's house, you take a hand towel, put it on the floor, set place, and that dog won't come off. Sure. Um, so no, I don't think you'll have a problem with that at all, um, because a, a dog, if they ever move off the place without me telling them to, they're corrected and they're put back. Sure. Sure. Um, even though I know what you're saying, because you know we were both raised, so to speak, in training. You never call a dog off sit. You never call a dog off place, because if you do, you're creating a creeper. Right. Um, which is a dog that's going to move involuntarily, I mean, voluntarily without you being told to. Right. But I don't think you'll have. I mean, I never call a dog. Like if I have one of my dogs in the kennel here with me and they're on place, I don't call them off of it. I just don't. Sure. In my mind, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. But you know. Like when I go do shows and stuff, a lot of times they'll have dogs up on gunner kills or on whiskey barrels or something, and that's their place. Um, yeah. Come hell or high water, they're staying there, whether I'm gone or not. Right. Um, and that's the beauty of, of the place for um, Like young dogs, when I'm wanting them initially to learn to sit and stay without me being in the picture, I'm doing it on the board first. Right. Because I know they know if they're on or off of it. Um, so. Yeah, and I think, I totally agree with you. I think the transfer of the place training can get to a point it gets to any object. Like, you know, I'm placing them on, I was up north and there's a piece of cardboard. I tear it off, I put it down, and for the puppy, I put her on there because her remote sit for an hour isn't realistic. My older dogs, yeah, we can do that. She can't. Giving her the ability to see that def def defined area made the difference, and it was just a piece of cardboard. But I don't, you know, I'm never going to get away with that with her when she's a lot younger than that. We, we eventually get to it. I just really feel like I thought when he talked about the size of it, because in the video, I think his, his example is he's got a dog that lays down. He had a, a client's dog that had a bad habit of laying down. 
And he right. said, part of the problem is the, bed, the board he was using was too big. Gave the dog too much room. And I started thinking about that and going, you know, I, I looked at him and they are pretty small. It, but he uses labs in that video. And when those Labradors are on there, it's tight. But I almost think, make it so uncomfortable that they really can't move around a ton. Make it so that they can pivot. But if they start moving around too much, they're almost falling off. And so I think there's, there's where that value in the size. You don't think of, I don't think of always those tiny little details as being that important, but I really think that might make a huge difference. Right. And I know like with him, whenever he first starts his dogs, he'll take two of those 15 by 24 place boards and shove them together. Yep. yep. And he says he's put them a bigger target to hit, sure. which is true. And then you real quickly, after they're good at that, you're going to separate those boards out. So, you know, you'll put a foot between them so you can move from place to place. Sure. And uh, you're teaching the dog place can be multiple locations, which is it's helpful when you're going to the house, too. Yep. You know, it, it's my house. Place is either in front of my television or next to my bed. Sure. I don't want to have seven places the dog can go. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's just... It's just a foundation of so many early things. Even like, you know, with you guys shed honey, you know, you got a dog quartering back and forth in yep. front of you. Well, I can teach a, a cocker who does that naturally anyway, but I can teach them to really watch my hands pretty quickly and early on with place training. Sure. Just by moving them back and forth to boards. Um, so great. So uh, now I'm going to ask you another question. So the... And, and this is for me as well. I watched the video. I'll watch it again. I'll probably order the new one. The I, I will, and I, I don't know why I said probably. I will order the new one now. So people that are listening, can you walk through? And, and I realize it's there's a lot of levels and dynamics to it, but can you walk us through just a, a basic concept on the value or the reason why you, the, the reason for the place board training and what you're getting out of it just from a person who's never because I do I saw a couple people ask questions um, what videos are they Ben is jumping on there and trying to share he's sharing this one and what we'll do too is we'll post a picture of them yeah. Jay if you'd do me a favor if you'd take a picture of that new video and just text it to me when you get a chance we'll post that um, and if we can if we find a link is it a Paul French video too so we'll pull a we'll pull a, a link and we can post that um, if you could walk, so some people haven't seen this, and if you could walk through that process, are we losing them? Yeah, I love, you want to walk through what process, Jeremy? I'm sorry. If you could just give us a, a general idea for someone who has not seen the videos before, the okay. idea of what place board training is, real, real aerial view of it, and the value you're yep. gaining from it. Um, one, I would say place board training has three big things for me. One, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create steadiness in the dog. It's going to create uh, confidence in the dog as far as a place to be. It's going to make them a better member of the family. You know, if your wife isn't real keen on you having a dog in the house, if the dog is place trained well, it is you and the dog both become superheroes really fast. Sure. Um, but, like I said, as far as starting the dog off, Initially, I'm going to have a, I don't know, four-month-old dog, five-month-old dog on a leash. And you can start it way earlier if you want to. Just in my hands, I like, I like the dog to have a lot of confidence, yep. especially my cockers before I get going on it. Um, you're just going to have the dog on a leash and walk them up to it and get them on there. Once they get all four feet on there, I'm going to love on them, praise them. I'm not going to say the word place yet. That's going to be our ultimate command. But I just want the dog to want to be on that location. On I want them to put their feet on this and feel it and know that that's where I want them to be at. Um, you know, with time, we're going to, you know, when I'm using the Kato boards, I'll add a second board in. If I'm using the ones I've made by myself, I'm going to smush them together um, and just have one target. But like I said, I want to separate them as quick as I can so that young dog can learn to go back and forth. Um, all this is happening initially on a leash. Um, where I'm just guiding them back and forth on the board. But for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, dogs love to be on place boards. I mean, it is, I've got one of my stud dogs named Browse. If he's in a seminar with me um, for a puppy picking and I throw a board on the ground, he'll jump off whatever he's on and come get on the board. It's just like cocaine. Sure. Uh, 
like I said, you're gonna you're gonna move your dogs back and forth on the boards just by same place. But as Jeremy was talking with Bella, uh, you know this board is is rectangularly shaped. Uh, so if I'm having a problem with delivery, I'm gonna have this board out in front of me like this. Sorry, you lost my head. Uh, for that dog when he comes back, because I always want my dogs to deliver to the front. Yep. That dog's gonna come back, sit down on this board, and raise his head right up to me. So. I'll have the boards, uh, you know, sometimes I'll use two, open shot all I use is four. I'll have two next to each other like this, but then I may make it about square out of the boards to where I can call the dog to me and move the dog back and forth. Once the dog is good on being on the boards and it's secure, then I'll start throwing a ball or something to where they have to stay steady to that. And it's easier, rather yeah. than, I mean, if they're just sitting on the ground, it's easy to break the rule. If they're up on something they know they have to stay on, you can get steadiness in the dog pretty quick with that. Um, and if they get off, you just have a, you know, I keep a little slip of collar on them, bring them back over, set them back again, and I'll go pick my ball up myself. Mm -hmm. um, once they know they have to stay, then they're released to go get it. Or, I throw the ball, and I'll move them to the next board. I'll move them away, I'll teach hand signals at an early age mm -hmm. About you know, they're being sure. Yeah, I see a ton of. That's another thing I. See. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. That's another thing I see an opportunity for some value in would be the the handling. Um, oh, absolutely. In 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 you're like you just said you're doing it without them knowing it. You know, you're doing it without you knowing it. It's right. built. It's all of a sudden become a part of this exercise and becomes very normal and becomes very understand. I think it's very, first off, I think it's very understandable. And I think the place board itself, like the steadiness part, to me, it's, a, it's the definition of having a black and white on or off. You know, you get these little pups on the ground, you pitch the ball and they get, they might not move their back feet, but they move their front feet. And are you moving or aren't you moving? Where on that board, they're on or they're off. If they adjust their feet, technically they're good, you know, and we're giving, I think we're giving them this chance, it, making it a little easier to start out with is, is to me, the, a value of that as a tool. Right, right. And the other thing you can teach them on those boards are, you know, you teach them like a, a heel position. So sure. if they're sitting there next to me on that board, well, I start moving around that board and I can get them to, to follow me around that sure. board if I want to just by saying heel and guiding them. So, you know, sometimes with me, heel is, and probably with you too, I know it is with you, Jeremy, heel is like critical. Yeah. If heel isn't right, nothing's right in my world. Yep. But if I can teach the little dog to follow me around and heel with me, and they learn that, oh, he wants me right on his left knee, that's just mind blowing. And that is something that I've never done before. That new, new DVD, he talks about that. And I'm like, ah. Sure. Why didn't I think about that before? But it, it just makes it dead simple. Right. Do you think from a from a so t let's talk a I want to talk a little bit about the cockers because I I don't I've never uh, Todd our another mutual buddy of ours uh, Todd Rashalo yeah. you know Todd he's got one of your dogs um, another another mutual friend that we've known for a long time so Todd's got Bailey and I've hunted I've hunted with Bailey we went up to the Northwoods girls hunted with that little spaniel and. Fun to really a lot of fun to watch. Different, um, and and I watch some of the um, spaniel trials. I, I get onto YouTube and I watch, and I almost watch them because I can't help but if you watch, if you had a camera on me when I was watching them, I, you'd see a big smile because I just think it's really, I think it's amazing to see. Uh, my friend had a, in college had a Springer, and he. Well, was hands down the best retrieving dog I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen a dog want to retrieve so much in ever. And but the pace that that dog moved and did everything was mind blowing and a little bit it wore me out watching. And then I watched these little cockers and I go, these things make that his name that dog's name was Morgan. I I said these dogs make Morgan look lazy. I mean, yeah. it's incredible the ground they cover. But what I think is most Im most impressive, maybe, is the handle that these guys have on them, and the way they work together. 
And I go, at such a pace, how does a dog, the dog has incredible levels of control to not overrun its body. Like it's mind and body to, when they sync up, and I've watched, I, I mean, this is another thing, I've followed Jay's page forever since he started it. Um, I, I really enjoy it. There's, I, I just like following and seeing what other people are doing. And I got a ton of respect for you, Jay, with what you're doing. And I, I've always said, it's fun to watch your dogs. And it's got to be fun to be on the other end of it. I also think you better know what you're doing on the other end of it. Because I think a dog like that is probably intimidating to a guy like me who is used to, and you know labs, and 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 I'll, I was gonna, I'm going to ask you this later, but the amount of handle you have and control, can you talk, like, does this, I have to think that this place board training really helps to build that connection, strengthen that connection and forge it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what you said, Jeremy, one, I, I always tell people, if you don't have a smile on your face when a cocker's working, you have no soul and you yeah. should never own a dog. Uh, but they are the most relationship-based dog. And by that, I mean, if my relationship with that dog, when it's in the field working, if we're not on the same page, it's, it's no good. Right. But if we're working together, it's a thing of beauty. Sure. Uh, but these little guys, too, I mean, it takes them about seven seconds to look at their handler and say, you know what you're doing. Or you don't know what you're doing. And if you sure. don't know what you're doing, they're going to punish you. Um, and it will be ugly. Uh, but it's, it, it's, there's, there's nothing, it's just exciting. I mean, just totally exciting. I mean, when you have a 20 pound dog pulling back a cockpit from North Dakota and it's dragging on both sides, but it's coming back full force. It's, sure. It's Tons of heart in that little dog. Oh, nobody's ever told them how little they are. And right. That's awesome. Right. Biggest, yeah. biggest change for you when you started working with them, like, do you have... So Labradors, you've got a lot of experience with them. What what do you see as primary, do you, are there primary differences that go, or do you take a, and the reason I ask this is I just had a Malinois um, that I helped, a friend of ours that has, and it was a Malinois Shepherd mix, and they, we, we I worked with it for them, um, not, not the whole time that they had it, and I had it when it was a little pup, and I had it more recently, um, and I had a lot of people tell me when we were gonna when we were doing it, you're not gonna be able to do it how you do. You're not gonna be able to do it the same way you're used to. Uh, get ready for a rude awakening, all this stuff. And I I went maybe you know okay I I don't know because I've not I personally have not worked with one very much more than like a workshop where someone might bring it. Um, right. I hear that same thing. I'm gonna get a setter. I'd like to get an English setter. I'm looking for next spring. Um, and when I've had a lot of the pointer people that I know and talk with say, you're never going to be able to do it, uh, not how you're used to, it's wake, you're going to have a rude awakening, what, what a change. And I, I listen to everyone with what they say because they've all got more experience than I do. But I, I personally go, I don't, a, to me a dog is a dog in a lot of respects. Yep. And I think the yep. general, I think there are a lot of finite things that are, that we differentiate. But in general, I've had a ton of success with every dog, it, it, you name the breed, we've had a lot of success with helping, and I think a lot of it has gone to, it's, I, the focus isn't so much mechanical as it is, uh, mechanics have to be there, but it's more the connection and the feel and the trust that the handler, they're, they're, like I think dogs are incredibly in tune with us, all of them. Oh, incredible, and, and one guy, uh, a guy that Ian put me in touch with out of New York State by the name of Brett Bradley, um, really, really got me to believe that more than anybody did. Um, it's just a relationship. You know, you have to have, I don't care what kind of dog you're training, there has to be some kind of relationship. That dog has to look at you as the leader and surrender to you and be willing to go do what you want to do. But, you know, you were talking about English setters, I and mean, I've trained some setters, I've trained some short hairs, I've trained, I've got a Brittany right now. Uh, to me, any dog, you have to look at, it's just a matter of, okay, here's my final product, here's here's the, the cover of the puzzle box. What steps am I gonna have to back out and do 
to get to my final product. I mean, the difference in the difference between a cocker and a lab is a lab I can make it do something. I feel like a Labrador I can force myself on that dog enough that it'll do what I want. A cocker, if the like I said earlier, if the relationship with that dog and I are not on, they will do nothing. But if I'm fair with them and I treat them with respect and that they'll do the same back for me. Uh, they they will kill themselves for me if if our relationship is right. But again, if I for example, if I uh, if I correct a dog and they view it as unfair, I've had some that will literally in the field working just get behind me and walk behind me like forget it. That wasn't right. Um, and, and if you train dogs We've all had those moments of, I, I lost my cool. Sure. That was not the right thing to do. Um, and, and the dog, there's some dogs that are okay with it, some dogs aren't okay with sure. it. Um, and if you train dogs and you say you've never lost your cool, I'm going to call you a liar. Because totally. Because that's just, I mean, it's, it's not life. I mean, I have such a passion for these dogs and want them to be so good that sometimes I off too much on them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one thing, I, I don't know about you, Jeremy, but I've learned over the last several years, um, there's a lot of dogs that need to be a puppy for a while. You know, putting them into to training too soon is the worst thing you can do with them. You know, bird dogs are a perfect, perfect example of that. I mean, they kind of need that time in life to be wild and crazy and run and, and gain the drive that they need to work independently. Um, where a Labrador is typically going to be much more close ranging, dependent on me, you know, doing the retrieving sort of thing. Did you right. maybe start? Yeah, uh, I agree. But I also think I always caution, and, and this is a great place to have this conversation. I'm really enjoying this because I think it's important for other people to hear this. I think the the idea of I totally agree that some dogs mature slower and it just takes I, I if I'm anything I'm on this I'm on erring on the side of like I'm slow like Craig and I have talked about this where Craig's dogs will be further ahead of mine month to month always he's just they just always are where I and I don't worry about it it used to bother me and I used to compare myself to you know where other dogs were at certain ages and it in in I was really glad when I got to this point, and this is several years ago, I got to this point where I realized it doesn't really matter where we are at halftime. The score matters at the end of the game. And so I'm, a, and I think we, you know, I've, I've, by taking that pressure off of myself as a trainer, it's made my life a, a lot more enjoyable. I, 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 I enjoy the process more so now than I do the ending, which I think is a real turning point for me where I used to, I used to not necessarily look at it that way. But I also think your expectations and my expectations and Ben's and the the idea of letting them be a puppy is really relative. And yours and my idea is probably a lot different than Tim and Joe down the road that just got a pup. Because I, I get those I get the message from the people a lot of times and, and I, I'm sure you've heard this is, you know, I, what are you doing with these dogs when they're this age? And it'll be a, you know eight weeks till six months. What do you do with those puppies? And I, I don't want to give a lot of instruction to be like, you need to be achieving certain milestones because I just don't measure stuff by time. But I also think it's a really fine line between letting them be a puppy and letting them be a puppy with good guidance. And like I tell people, kids... I can't, we've got, you know, you've got kids, I've got kids, these kids can't just be kids until they turn 16 and then we'll focus on them behaving or we're screwed at 16, like, so I think what I, what I want to be really careful of anyone that's listening to this and watching is, I don't want you to hear us say this and go, we don't do anything with them for the first few months, we just let them be puppies, because you'll have a hell of a time I think recovering, I think it's this understanding of there's only so much you put on them and they dictate a lot of the ability and and the distance you go with them. We're always, I think, shaping them. Like it's, they're so moldable. And that's where I go, 
I don't think you and I, our ideas of what we would call probably for, formally training or, or doing some more formal things are probably different than a lot of people that are new to training. You know what I mean? Right. And I think that um, like we've got a little white dog by name in right now called Corky. It's going to be our dog. Um, the first six months of her life, I would say I did nothing. But it was I did nothing under control. Do you know what I mean? I would, I would take her for walks, not on a leash. Sure. But when I said, Corky, come here, she knew about that bit. Sure. It's almost like, you know, uh, it's like, you know, taking your kid to second grade and expecting them to do algebra. You know, some people have that expectation. I've got a dog that's three months old. I want to do an X, Y, and Z. Well, just relax. Right. You've got lots of time to do that. Yeah, you need to be teaching them some basic math. But... Don't push them too fast, too hard, right. because, uh, and like you, I mean, I remember my friend Nigel that I spoke about earlier from Northern Ireland, he, I had a sister to one of his dogs, we imported her, um, and he saw the dog I had when she was probably eight months old of what I was doing with her, and, and he said, you know, his, his dog's name was Faith, I'm not doing anything with Faith, he said, but at two years old, I guarantee my dog will be better than your dog. And he was right. It's sure. you know, after you've done it long enough, you know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and how much you know you can put on the dog. It's just a matter of reading that dog when it's ready to take the training. Don't you think? Totally. Now with your Corky, yeah. Corky's your white uh, dog. Yes. You yeah. you now you said you didn't you didn't really you haven't done her you ha didn't do anything until she was six months ish. Correct. So as far as like, even on a leash, I didn't even put her on a leash before that. So when you say you got her to come to you when you called her, yep. you did something to be able to get her to understand to come, right? right. So, so I always tell my clients, in, in the first 30 days, if you can do three things, if you can teach the puppy to come to you when you call it, which is dead simple, the dogs want to be with you at a young age. Yep. Don't just get it on the ground when they're running to you, say here. Um, if you can get them to learn to come here, to get into a crate or a kennel on command, and learn a bathroom command in the first 30 days of it they have. So from eight weeks to 12 weeks, you'll have a dog at 12 weeks old that's smarter than 90% of the dogs in America. Personal opinion. Uh, so when I say I'm not doing anything, I'm not teaching the dog to heal. I'm not teaching the sure. dog to sit. They are learning to go pick a ball up and bring it back to me. But there's no steadiness in that. It's just sure. go wild, go crazy, go get it. Um, so yeah, in, in our definition, Jeremy, probably I'm not training. Right. And other people's views, oh my gosh, look at everything you've done. Exactly. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just having a good time. That's just it. And that's what you, you just nailed it. So like I think, and the idea of like when you're rolling a tennis ball for them and they're picking it up and bringing it back to you, A, I, like we are not training them to do that. It's in them. We're bringing right. it out of them, right? So. The definition, I think it's really important for people to understand, when we say we're not training them, we are molding them and shaping them, we're letting them do what they do naturally that's good and desirable, and we're making sure that we avoid, I, I, and I'm not going to speak for you, but the other thing is, is I think is real important to understand is that we are, we are when something comes up that is not desirable, we're, pro we're trying to e eliminate it or avoid it altogether. And when it happens, we're putting some type of a correction to it so they understand it's not what we want. Right. And, and, and again, not, not formal, not like, not real formal training anything, but I just, I, I want to stress because I just, I know what people are going to do is they're going to listen to this and they're going to have a little puppy and they're going to go, don't do anything with it for a few, few months. And then they're going to send you and me an email and they're going to go, I did what you told me and I got a hellion on my hands. Won't come when I call them. Well, the, the beauty of what you're talking about is they're coming to us anyway. We just walk around and they follow us. Right. Turn that into recall training. Have that be an opportunity to get them to, right. to respond in a positive way. So, I, again, I think it's relative to the idea of what we call training and what someone else calls training. Because I think there's a lot of people, my parents are guilty of it. Like, my parents are dog lovers. They're, they've gotten me to be a dog lover. But they're not formally trained. They don't formally train their dogs. They're, they're they, they, very, very little, minimal. And they would look at what you do with those dogs those first six months and go, wow, he really does a lot of training with that little puppy. When we look at it and we go, no, 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 we're just, we're just, 
we're just bringing out good things that are there, and we're trying to keep the bad, the things that aren't real good at, at a minimum. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and one thing I did, you know, early on, especially with, even with the coppers, is I tried pushing too hard too fast as far as doing what I call sure. formal training, and I burned all that out. I mean, I, I, I full disclosure, um, I did it on, on YouTube. I, I trained a little dog by the name of Sage. Um, I, he's not as good today as he could be had I gave him six months to grow up before I started doing stuff. Sage was a dog, that, that was a dog for? I trained it for Cubby Rise Magazine. Yep, beautiful um, little dog. And, uh, that was not a love connection there at all. Um, that was a little too much, just, I don't know what happened. It, it just didn't work out. And now he lives on a plantation in South Georgia, which is killed a life. I wish I could be Sage. Um, but yeah, it's just, I, I put too much pressure too fast, required too much discipline of him. Uh, it just didn't work out. Let me ask I, you. I took, I, I took his fire away from him. I, I poured water on his fire, basically. I should have. Let me ask you this. Do you think, yeah, this is awesome. I'm really glad we're having this conversation. Do you think it had anything to do with you were, I mean, you, re, you, you documented that training. Pretty, right. I mean, I, I, I watched a lot of it. I saw a lot of it. First off, that dog is a really beautiful dog. But yeah. do you think by documenting it the way you did, probably more than, more documentation than, Another any other dog that you maybe had for a client or yourself, do you right. think that that was part of the reason that in the end you now say I probably pushed it a little bit too far, too fast? Absolutely. I, it was he was a dog that I said he's the copyright mascot. He's got to do this. He's got to be perfect. Yeah. And instead of just saying you know what, it's not working out. We're not gonna you know. Yeah. There, there's dogs I have right now. Um, if, if they're having a bad, if, if we hit a, a stage in our training, the wheels are falling off the bus, I'll just stop. I'll put them away for a week. Yep. I won't do anything. I may yep. take them for a walk. Yep. But if the way I train dogs are, I train, I train up. If you want, I train very few dogs for one. I just don't think that I train a bunch of dogs, but I train on flat feet. You're going to pay me this much money to do these skills. Yep. And if it takes me six months or a year, the pressure's off of me then. Yes. And the pressure's off the client. They're not paying me more. Just let me do what I do as the dog will let me do it. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to win in the long run. Yeah. I, that's exactly how we do it. I don't, it's a flat, it's a one price. And it's when right. the dog, and people always ask, when's it ready? When the dog's ready, I'm ready and you're ready. Like that's, those right. three things all have to be there. And right. I, the reason I ask that is because we, we have done several dogs now, um, and I'm loving it because I just think it's become real valuable for people. It's a hell of a lot of work. It's a ton of, it's a ton of work. But by training dogs and documenting, and Ben has been a huge part of this for me. Bella is a dog that we're, we're documenting and, and posting videos of her on YouTube. And it's been, she's a little over a year right now. She's nowhere near as far as a lot of people would have their dogs at a year old. I'm more than comfortable with it. I love it, in fact. And the, the thing about it that's, I think, surprising to people is how boring the series probably is. It's also why people watch it. Because I think people realize he does the same damn thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And all of a sudden, over the course of a couple months, if you look at 90 days into it versus day one. Wow, what a difference. But it took me 90 days to get there and you saw these minuscule changes. And sometimes the changes were backwards. Like, it, there's just, there is no hiding it. It's very candid and it's very like, shit happens, right? And so things don't always go good. I think what hearing you say that is valuable because we, you and I both, will make as many mistakes as anyone else and I'll put my hand up as high as anyone as anyone out there to say yes I do and I I don't think for a second that I won't in the future like I'm going to continue to I I really think there are opportunities to get better but I also think we when we do that and show it I think it allows other people to realize Christ the problems that I'm having are the same ones they're having 
to me it's we're important. Doing, we're actually doing a series on Porky right now, um, but I've learned my lesson that we probably have 15, 20 videos made, and we won't even start with, we're going to do another 10 album. We won't start releasing it until June. Where with, with Sage, I was doing it, you know, I filmed myself on Thursday and put it out on Saturday. So I was working real time. Right. And that's a, that's a bad lesson I learned myself with him is, totally. you know, he had to learn X, Y, and Z this week. Then I got to make a video. Yep. Um, you can't do it with a dog. Dogs just, there's just times they need a few days off like we do. Totally, totally, and that's exactly what we're doing with Bella. You know, Bella, we're we're posting Bella videos. You post them every other day. Yep. But we we had thirty days of it. We had thirty videos of it, and that wasn't thirty days. Thirty day, thirty videos was probably sixty days because we didn't film every day, and we didn't do. I didn't do everything. I didn't do something with her every day. You know, and we we just tried to make that as clear as possible. We've got two minutes. Two minutes. So we've got two minutes, Jay, before our Instagram is going to be done. So first off, I want to thank you. Uh, yeah. th this was awesome. Great. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I want I want you to give everybody a chance. Where can they find more stuff out on Raglan, on your stuff, your training? Yeah, just raglangundogs.com is our website. And then we're on Instagram and Facebook, just under Raglan Gun Dogs. Uh, the place boards that I talked about, the Cato boards, if you are interested in those, I know you can go to catooutdoors.com and... There's a like a discount code you can put in Reichlin, and I think you get you get something off. Um, I'm not gonna say the amount because uh, I don't want to screw Jordan. Uh, but no, guys, it's it's been a pleasure to be with you um, and just talk to the training and stuff. Uh, it's whoever's listening to it, you know, like Jeremy and I have said, it, it's more important as you're training to enjoy the trip as you're going than it is to hurry and get to the final destination. Totally. You know, and that's something I've learned from failure. So learn learn from my mistakes that, that it's a great thing to do, especially if you have one dog, man. God, mm -hmm. why don't we do that to just have one dog again and be able to pour all your time into that? Totally. But, Jay, yeah. I appreciate it, man. I'm gonna We're going to put a link up to the open shot videos. If you could send me... Uh, you'll send me a screen if you can send me a shot of the other one or I can Google it too I, we can do that um, and then what we'll do is we'll put a link on there for those boards too um, and then that way we can get people the stuff they need but uh, yeah. dude I appreciate it thank you we'll have to do this again I, it goes fast doesn't it we'll do it alright buddy take care have a great evening stay safe healthy and positive alright All right. we're still we're on still Facebook do you yeah. want to answer some questions? Yeah, let's do a let's um, do a quick one. Vicky, how many you got? A lot of them. Not not a terrible amount. Okay. Um, Vicky's been using. She said she used place boards with Breeze. Um, looks like she had some success with it, so that's good. Mike Knapp asked, "How high do either of you value bloodline of a dog?" Oh, I think. So it's a the question being genetics. How important yeah. are they? Yep. I think they're really important. I think it's. Should I hit share your story on this? Yeah. yeah. I think they're really important. Uh, how high do I value it? Incredibly high. And the reason is because when I am, first off, I think um, certain genetics make things easier, uh, make, make some training easier. So secondly for me is if we're training a dog for a client, I have, the person bought a dog from us because they saw our dogs. And in order for us to provide a consistent product, um, it takes, I think, a dynamic of the handler and the dog. And when those two marry up, that's when you get that consistency over and over and over again. So to me, that is really important. Um, I think the other part is matching up the right genetics and style of dog to your style of training, hunting, and life. And I think when you combine all those together, if you do, if you have the ability to kind of research that ahead of time, you combine all those things together, um, that's when really good things happen. So I do think it's really important. Do I think, you know, I think what I don't want someone to say is, well, I don't know that I have the great genetics. Um, I can't have a good dog. Because I've seen dogs that were rescues turn into phenomenal dogs. 
So I think that the dog is a part of the equation and the handler is the other part. And we make up or lack for each other. Sometimes dogs are just so good at stuff, they, they turn out really good despite their trainer. And sometimes dogs just aren't, don't have necessarily all the talent, but their handlers are so good and the connection is so strong, they get better end, end product than the guy that doesn't know what he's doing with a better, better stock of dog. So why does it keep flashing? It's like, it, it does that. It's like a, shows us a little preview of what it looks like. Okay. But so can, is there a way to turn that off? It's freaking me out. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, Next question. Terry Mortensen in from Idaho. Hello. Uh, what kind of beer are we drinking? We're drinking Rhinelander Shorties. They're the best. Hodeg. That's the story behind Hodeg. I tried to open a Corona, but it looked like it was a, not a twist off. So yeah, Too soon, my friend. Yeah, too soon. Okay, what else we got? Um, we've got Justin has a first year shed dog. Justin is a first year shed dog trainer slash wannabe. He's a one year old GSP that retrieves well and finds horns that he hides, but hasn't found a fresh shed. Should I be doing something different or should I be concerned? Well, I wouldn't be concerned. I think the question is, is how many fresh sheds have you found? You know, you got to look at the reality of how many opportunities has your dog had. I think a lot of people get disappointed that their dogs aren't finding antlers and they think they're struggling and doing something wrong. And then I say, how many antlers have you found? And they say, none. And I go, well, if there aren't any antlers there, the best shed dog in the world won't find them. So I do think that that is a part of it. And the other part of it is, is it takes enough repetition and, and you need to do something enough consistently to have it be good. If you are a basketball player and you shoot 15 jump shots three times a week, you will not be a very good shooter. If you find one antler in a year and have an opportunity for one antler for the dog, it's hard for them to get good at it. They got, you've got to give them opportunity. So that is the hard part. Um, you know, bird dogs, you can't, turn, you can't turn a good pheasant dog into a pheasant dog without any pheasants. But you can't turn a fe good pheasant dog into a pheasant starting them with pheasants. It just doesn't work. So it's this process that you prepare for, you work your way to it, and then eventually you get to the actual birds, and then you need to hunt them, and then you got to put birds up, and then you got to have, uh, I think seasons. I don't. We don't. We don't consider a dog really. I never consider them finished. I don't consider them efficient and effective really until they get a couple seasons under them. And I mean, they got to be good seasons. They got to get. You gotta shoot a lot of birds over a bird dog to get them to be a bird dog. Yeah, flush. We we flushed. 200 and 292 grouse. No, 262 grouse this, this last year. Um, How many wood count? 64. And that was over a period of six weeks. So on the weekend. And on the weekends. And that, for a lot of people, would say you would say, wow, that's a really good year. And it is, I think, a really good year, um, considering grouse numbers. It's really hard to develop a really, really good grouse dog when you give it 290 opportunities in its life. That's what it's had, that's what those dogs have had so far. So they need more, they give them more opportunity. So that's, you know, it, you, have to, you have to be realistic with it. I think Caitlin had um, burning energy. She says, one year old chocolate dogs, as, and, and as dog parents, we had let him Develop a bad habit of wanting to play chase in the backyard. We've been taking them out on a leash. It seems to, just wants to run and get energy off. Yeah, you, 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 part of it is you probably have created that. Any suggestions on how to burn energy? Don't burn energy. I think we, we look at burning energy as a way to tire dogs out. And the reality is, is all you're doing is conditioning an athlete. The more you condition the athlete, the longer and the harder it takes for the dog to get tired. So I, t I ju we just answered this yep. uh, in a po podcast mm -hmm. today. Um, you have to balance mental and physical energy burn off, if you, you know, spending it. So the balance needs to be, they have to be thinking about it as they're doing something physically. If all you do is let them run, they just become really good athletes. 
And so you have to find balance. So I like, Caitlin, that you're bringing the dog out on a lead. That makes the dog think as long as it's in heel position. If you take the dog out on a lead and the dog just lunges and drags you around, you're training. You're just training the wrong thing. You're training poor heel work and you're training the idea of freedom and run wild. So now you're doubly, you're doing double negative behavior. So you got you got to start. It's a cultural thing. It's I'm telling you right now, dogs a year old. If you've been doing this for ten months, since it was two you know two months old when you brought it home, if you've been doing it for ten months, it might take you ten months to reverse it. Are you willing to grit your teeth, put the lead on, and go? We're gonna go outside, heal, and you got to heal well. I if you if you've watched any of the Bella Be Good series, today I went to the shop three times. I think I went down there. I put her on lead and I healed her in perfect heel position three times down and back to the shop. It's a quarter mile down, it's a quarter mile back. It's a half mile. I did it three times. I did a mile and a half without taking any extra time because I had to go there anyway. And I put her in good heel position and she healed at my, at my left knee. And what I've worked on with her is getting her back a half a step. That's why I had her on lead. I let her off with off the lead and she wasn't allowed to free run. She healed about 15 yards with me in perfect position. And then I said, okay. And I let her go to do her bath, do the bathroom. Then I called her back, put her on lead, and I finished out the perfect heel. She's a year old. I've got a hell of a lot of work into her right now. And that's what I did with her for bathroom break. So the reason I did it is because she now, I walk around the yard and she's, I bump, it, I bump her, I feel her in my left knee. Because she just comes to my left knee. She just likes being there. She knows it's the right spot to be. It, it takes time. And if, we, and if I had waited until now to start this, I'd have to do it a lot longer, I think, to get the end result. But you can do it. And I don't, I'm not saying it's going to take you 10 months. It's going to take you a while if you're consistent. And I say 10 months because when it happens in six, you'll be really happy. But you need to change that behavior. Okay. And Camera work is phenomenal. Ha! Huh. Who said that? Go up. Cooster. Yeah, he's kind of, he likes it. Uh, yeah. That would be good inside the workshop. Awesome. John had a real nice question. Okay. Uh, John Wolfman says, as someone working towards a mullet like Ben's, what is the oh, best boy. conditioner to use to keep my hair looking good and soft to the touch, especially with all the current COVID restrictions that keep us from having our hair worked on? Is there a dog shampoo that can be used as double duty? How does he know your hair is so soft to the touch? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yikes. I replied, a mixture of Old Spice and Man Tail. <laughs> Just fishing buddies, I promise. Okay, that's it. Great job. Thank you guys for watching on Facebook. We finished it up on Instagram a little while ago. Appreciate you guys. This is going to turn into a uh, podcast. We just did a, another podcast today. Um, and that's going to be, might be live already, huh? Uh, it, it will be by the morning. So, again, thank you guys on Facebook. Uh, we appreciate your support and stay, stay with it. Like we're getting through these weird times, stay with it. We stay strong and positive and healthy and all that stuff. Um, we're going to continue to pour on the gas to try to help as much as we can when it comes to dog training at least. So, uh, thank you guys for the support. We appreciate it.